All right, gross story time. Hepatitis A is passed from one person to the next via the fecal oral route. In other words, to get hepatitis A, you need to eat someone else's poo, which you don't do, obviously, except that you do all the time. Like if someone with hepatitis A goes to the toilet, doesn't wash their hands, touches some surfaces, you touch the same surfaces, then you touch some food, then you eat the food, you've eaten someone else's poo. And you can get hepatitis A that way. That's how a hepatitis A spreads through a community. But there's another way to get hepatitis A. In fact, someone with hepatitis A in Bangor in North Wales in the UK can give hepatitis A to someone in the Netherlands without leaving Wales. The process is quite remarkable. And actually the way we figured it out was remarkable too. So here's the story. Hepatitis A is not endemic to Wales. You don't see it often in Wales, but one person from Wales went on holiday to somewhere in the Caribbean where it is endemic. They picked it up because they weren't vaccinated and they brought it back and they passed it on to everyone in their household through the fecal oral route. Then they all went to hospital. The hospital had the foresight to sequence the genome of the virus before sending them home and saying, get well soon. Now, when you have hepatitis A, you go to the toilet rather a lot. And every time you do, you release trillions of viral particles into the toilet. What we flush down toilets is treated before it's released into rivers and oceans. But as bad luck would have it, during the time of this household's hepatitis A infection, there was heavy rainfall. And in the UK, we have a system that combines what comes from our toilets and sinks with what falls through our storm drains. Normally that's not a problem, but when you have really heavy rainfall, it can overwhelm the water treatment system and any excess is released untreated. As bad luck would have it, this household happens to be situated in an area where wastewater eventually finds its way to major shellfish harvesting waters in North Wales. Let's look at mussels in particular. They're filter feeders, which means they draw water in from their environment, they keep hold of the juicy bits, and they blow everything else back out. But it turns out they're pretty good at holding on to hepatitis A virus particles. They're bioaccumulators of hepatitis A. We then ship those mussels to a major distributor in the Netherlands who ship them out all over Europe. Then all around Europe, you get these new cases of hepatitis A and then new outbreaks in those communities through the fecal oral route. And this is all thanks to one person in Wales who went on a holiday to the Caribbean without a vaccination against hepatitis A. How do we know that these European cases of hepatitis A came from Welsh mussels? Like maybe these Dutch people went to the Caribbean as well. Well, you can interview patients and say, have you eaten mussels recently? The problem is the incubation period for hepatitis A is really long. They might not remember what they've eaten. And they've certainly thrown the packaging away that has the serial number on it that you can use to track down the ultimate starting point of the muscles. But it's okay because viruses mutate incredibly quickly. So if you find a virus here in the Netherlands and another one here in Bangor in Wales, and you compare the genomes, if you discover that those genomes are really similar, it means that not much time has passed between them. They must be closely related. So we're only able to put this picture together because hospitals sequence the genomes of certain viruses when patients come in so that we have this database of viral genomes. And it's only because we have this incredible international cooperation when it comes to infectious diseases. This isn't just an isolated story. It happens all the time, all over the world, and not just with hepatitis A, and not just through muscles. So it's amazing that we can draw these conclusions, and it's really important that we use that information. But we still don't have a complete picture. Like We still don't fully understand the journey of the virus through the system. But I've been speaking to someone who's been taking a closer look. I'm David Jones from Environment Centre Wales. You know, you might have a, a town of 70,000 people, like Llandudno, close to us, and within there, there might be 500 people who have normal virus in an outbreak time. And each one of those are emitting a trillion viral particles every time they go to the toilet. Although the sewage treatment plant gets rid of 99% of them, actually 99% of a trillion 
you've still got a lot left over. When the fresh water hits the salt water, the salt actually causes the chemicals in the water to precipitate out. You get these little particles formed in the water. The viruses then stick onto the particles um, that are then now big aggregates, you know, big things in the water. Of course, they're the perfect size for filter feeders. So if you look at a mussel, for example, it's just continually harvesting particles out of the water. That's what it feeds on. And those particles only are produced when fresh water hits salt water. So that's why you find shellfish largely in estuaries because yeah. the particles drop out of solution and they're harvesting them up. Our project was called the Veracra Project. So the idea was that to identify where the major sources of these viruses were coming from. How long do they survive in the river system and in the marine system? And then how many get accumulated by shellfish? So we would go out, sample about 20 litres of water which is you know, a big volume like this. We then filtered the water and took it down to about this much, 50 millilitres. And from that, we then concentrated even further down to one millilitre. The machine that we use is quantitative, so we can tell you exactly how many norovirus particles that are there, how many adenoviruses. You know, in 20 litres, there might be you know, 10,000 or more of these you know, adenovirus in there. Yeah. Most of the, you know, the viruses that come out in faecal material are generally quite infective. The longer the viral particles are in the environment, the more likely they are to become damaged. So they become damaged by UV irradiation, sunlight, or from other enzymes released from other organisms in the water that basically break open the coats. Of the viruses that we're measuring in the water, how many are intact and how many are broken? So you can get stem cells that grow into little organoids um, from, you know, for example, from the human guts, you know, as an example, and you know, you basically can then infect norovirus on them, into them from contaminated waters. And if it's still infective, of course, it then goes into the human tissue, um, in tissue culture, and then the norovirus explodes. You know, explodes. Yeah. And generally speaking, there's actually a lot of infected particles there. So the the criticism that's been levelled by, particularly you know, some of the industries who are involved in releasing viruses into the environment, I think is, is unfounded. I think there is a lot of evidence. Davy Jones and his team also did some mathematical modelling of the flow of water through the system, and they discovered something really surprising. The virus comes down um, to the estuary, the water comes back in, it gets sucked back up the river, then comes down again, and then comes back again, and then actually it takes, you know, a lot of time for it to eventually go out to the sea. But during that time, what's actually happening is that batch of contaminated water is actually passing over the mussel beds and the, you know, the oyster beds, maybe eight or nine, possibly 10, maybe 15 times. And we never realized that. Yeah. You know, we always assumed that it would just be, you know, the water would just flow out into the ocean and would be gone. So actually so that- A single pass yeah. over, the, over the shellfish, yeah. essentially. And that's why shellfish are so good at harvesting because they got multiple goes at getting the virus. <laughs> Maybe that's why you have shellfish in those places. Yeah, because well, the, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And mussels like sewage. They grow bigger and fatter when they're fed on sewage. So these new technologies are giving us new information and new knowledge, but how should we use it? How should we change our behavior? Firstly, you know, I think we need to change the standards for water quality. I think we're testing for the wrong thing. I think, you know, at the moment we're testing for bacteria. And when you look at the survival of bacteria and viruses in water, they behave completely differently. You know, really what we want to be doing is testing for the things that make us sick, and that's viruses. And the reason we haven't done that before is because we've not had the methods to do that. Based on our knowledge now, we know that, for example, when you have storms, you have a lot of virus coming through the system. It's flushing the system out, basically. Um, and you can tell shellfish, shellfish harvesting areas or people on beaches. Instead of being reactive and saying, we've just measured high concentrations of the virus in the water, don't harvest shellfish for another three weeks. We don't need to go through that step of monitoring viruses. We know that there's high risk events are happening. We've got sewage discharges, we've got water at the right time of year in the winter, for example, when norovirus is in the population, because you know public health are monitoring viruses all the time. Um, you can see that. I mean, there's some really clever ways, which is harvesting information from Twitter. So, I mean, you know, how do you know when people are sick? Well, it's amazing how many people use Facebook and Twitter to report that they've got diarrhea or food poisoning. And what about you? Like, what if you've got norovirus or hepatitis A and you're totally shedding it everywhere? Is there something you can do for the greater good? I think actually the advice we should give is that you should be using a disinfectant at the same time when you go to the toilet. 
So really, you know, if you oh, add... Oh, so you go to the toilet, put some bleach down and then flush it or something. Exactly. Right. People think that eating oysters might be an aphrodisiac. I have the opposite <laughs> view of this. You only have to eat one oyster that's contaminated with, you know, the smallest amount of sewage and basically you can chalk norovirus and then you become the epicentre for another outbreak that person spreads. Person to person. Person yeah. to person outbreak. Wow. So why don't we cook oysters? Some people claim that they taste better if you don't <laughs> cook them, so... I've never tried one and I'm not keen to anymore. <laughs> um. So there you go. You know, watching the video back, I'm concerned that I've painted quite a negative picture of the shellfish industry, which I genuinely don't want to do. Like, it's a well-regulated industry. For example, all shellfish has to go through a purification process that takes 48 hours. It's called depuration, and it does a great job of getting rid of bacteria. It doesn't do such a good job of viruses, which is why we still get outbreaks. But the point is, you're supposed to cook your shellfish, and you're supposed to cook it well. And it's not like shellfish is the only food-based vector for the spread of viruses. For example, hepatitis E is often spread through pork that hasn't been cooked properly. So, you know, cook your pork properly as well. All right, thanks to the Eden Project for commissioning these videos with funding from the Natural Environment Research Council. The Natural Environment Research Council also funded Davy Jones's Viwacra project, so thanks to them for that as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.